got it. Fabulous photo of Heather. It's a lovely one, isn't it? It came from Carrick. Oh, it did. It's lovely. Yeah. Good yeah. On. Okay. Do we should have some sound? Hang on now. So, Marion, do we have to mute in between times so people don't hear us squabbling? Uh, Tilly's dealing with that when she does her <laughs> intro. <laughs> Give us a diary. Give us a diary. I give you a go on my ex. Give you a go on my ex. Give us a diary. I give us a diary. I give you a go on my ex. She wears the most exciting socks I've ever seen. Last time I saw her, saw them. I said, oh oh. Give us a diary. Give us a diary. I give you a go on my ex. Give you a go on my ex. Give us a diary. I give us a diary. I give you a go on my ex. She always calls me Mary Blake by mistake. Last time I saw her, she called me Mary. Oh, oh, with a song. I keep a story. I give you a go on my head. I give you a go on my head. Give us a story. I give us a story. I give you a go on my head. She whips up a Sammy in the fracky of a secky and it looks good, tastes nice. Nice wipe. Oh, with a story. Give us a story. My music doesn't say when I start it. Share a screen, you have to pull up your chair. Oh. So they're just getting organized. Sorry, I give you a go on my ass. 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 Oh, oh.
Who's the other one? Okay, she just come on. Because I like, I thought it was Why is it stopped? Oh, there's a sideways person. Hello, that's a man. <laughs> Who knows? We're trying everything for the first time. Oh, good. <laughs> We've had some practices, but. Not lots. Oh, I wonder if I have a nice event. She probably does. But they don't know either. If you would blow my ass, she always calls me Mary Blake oh. by the state. Last time I saw her, she called me Mary. Oh, oh, with a suit on. I give you a suit I give you a suit on my ass. I give you a go on my ass. I give you a suit on my ass. I give you a suit on my ass. I give you a go on my ass. She wins up beside me in a fracky of a secky and it looks good, tastes nice. Nice wife, oh. Two guys. 
I was thinking about when I was struck by feminism. How do we get Where are we? Until then, I held as gloomy a personal view as any potential suicide, and I would have argued as fiercely as most men and some women are now that poetry is never political. That she rises naked and newborn from her age, Athena from the head of Zeus. Yeah. To learn that, like Athena, my yeah. whole political framework was the product oh. of a male supremacist structure I'm was initially sure. as devastating as liberating. Oh, it is. I had so thoroughly wished to share the genius and beauty of language that to be reminded I was a woman with a role which in most eyes meant cleaning up, stitching up, totting up, and being available to look after the man, his genius, and his children sent me into poetic depression for a while. It seemed I had to reject everything that had gone before and start again in a new culture with a new language that wasn't even made. It took a while to recover. Recover? No, that's the wrong word. Reorientate. Pick up and go on. Changed. Not utterly. But as this extract from my 36th year breakout poem suggests, for good. This is the rage of a woman knowing suicides too closely, who spun in their convolutions and teetered on the lip of a crazy blowhole. This is the rage of a woman who knew hands around her throat and could not move, and afterwards walked timidly and would not face the suits that made her so. This is the rage at waste, at paralysis, at despair, the rage of a woman among women who sees them kill themselves in swallows and laugh grind into shot. Rage in among men, who sees a strut turn jailer at a cross and love use up. This is the rage that dances, dances, till armpits flower blades and the blue ecliptic urges strike. This is the rage that simmers behind irrevocable change. Two of the biggest factors in the lives of women poets have been powerlessness and isolation in a man-made world. Shared powerlessness can sometimes become a kind of strength. Good. It's not the same as yours. It's the same one, but it's a different bit of it. Emma, should I start now? No, my hearty, my. A really big welcome to you all uh, to the launch of Heather McPherson's book, I Do Not Seed, and our tribute to Heather McPherson herself. Um, how amazing to start with Heather reading um, live, so to speak, um, from a figurehead of face, full of that early um, Matata vibe. Um, thank you all for being here. I think others will be joining us as we go along. I'm Tilly Lloyd, and I'm your MC for our co-hosts today, Mary Ann Evans and Emma Lyons, who threw themselves at this organisational task with great, uh, amazing, uh, exuberant love. And uh, we hope you have your favourite drink at hand. And uh, for the 11 speakers, also your stopwatches, uh, because it's an ambitious run sheet, and we've got a 4pm finish line. Uh, so it's really hard to stick to three or five minutes, depending, but bearing in mind the essentialness of brevity and focus on Heather, we've got to somehow do it. Also, it's hard for an anarcho-lesbian like me to impersonate a serious traffic cop. <laughs> Six items of uh, housework, sorry. 
and then we can get on with the show. Please put your phones on Do Not Disturb. Um, please look on your Zoom screen up on the upper right corner, the very far right, you will see a, a little block and it says view. And usually most of us do Zoom in gallery, but if you click on view and then tick the speaker option, uh, that'll provide you a full screen uh, of whomever is speaking at the time. And also it'll mean that you can see the visual pop-ups that Marion and Emma have created to run through here and there in the event. Yes. Um, so assuming everyone is happy running a video on, um, and if everyone runs on unmute, there's a problem, of course, that your dog might bark, and that will be your face that goes full screen. But that won't happen, I'm sure. Uh, the advantage is, the biggest advantage of you running unmute is that speakers will be able to hear you clapping when you welcome them, which is good for the vibe. Um, if you feel a bursting comment or a question while the gig is going, um, just list it in, in chat, which is down the bottom of your screen, and uh, we can right away and have a, a, a parallel dialogue. Um, if you click everyone, it'll make it really interactive. Uh, we have a question and, and comment section at the end of this gig, um, but this chat can be running at the same time. Uh, there'll also be music clips running here and there, which is a good time to leap out of your chair and rush for a pee or do something else disinhibited. Um, and the last thing to notice in terms of housework is this event's only being recorded uh, for the spiral archive if Marion has everyone's consent. So please talk with Marion uh, if you haven't already. And I do hope you can say yes, because the spiral archive is the equivalent of our diamonds for the future. So Heather's 20, 74 years went from the 28th of May, 1942 to the 10th of January, 2017. This event roughly mimics that. It's roughly chronological in terms of her writing and life. So now it's time to get the show on the road. First, some surprise music for Renee, for author, radical lesbian, thespian Renee. And then after the music, I'll introduce her. Over to you, Emma. <laughs> The fence is all up, but the battle's over It never started, so why do I feel So lost and defeated and undeniably guilty I got a backseat in three Some say I like them for the call I don't mind This fire and this machine gun's never been felt before so I'll give you three to beat it But if you choose to stick around then Don't hide behind the fire Get away from the city Leave me, God damn, I've been guilty Don't hang about for no fame, fames You don't have to exclusive in that easy I've got my eyes in on Rises elsewhere, you see. But if you're ever lonely and you need some sweet loving, I'd buy someone's warm company. Someone that's easy and that sure ain't me, cause I've been guilty. Is that Hillary King? Yeah. It was Hillary King. Yep. She, she would have sung that yesterday at Jess Hall Coke and Stars uh, memorial service in Auckland, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, Renee. Renee is Nati Kahanunu and Gordon Kent, okay. a dramatist, poet, novelist, 
short story writer and blogger of the Wednesday Busk, which most of us follow, I'm sure. And Renee lives in Otaki. At age 50, she wrote her first play, Setting the Table, which kick-started four decades plus of feminist class and race consciousness storytelling for stage and play page. Renee is a living legend and has received numerous fellowships and awards, including an ONZM, the Play Market Award, the PM's Award for Literary Achievement, and the King Ehaka Award for Service to Toi Māori. Her recent memoir is These Two Hands, which was released in an updated and expanded second edition, and like the first, is a bestseller. Her second crime novel, Blood Matters, will be published later this year. Please welcome Renee to launch Heather's book. Oh, oh look at Janet. <laughs> Where's Renee? <laughs> I don't um, think she's here yet, Tilly. Ah, okay. Well, so shall we... How about we go on to... Emma Lyons uh, having the poem, the... Yeah? Yeah. We'll come we'll come okay. back to Renee. Okay, Emma. <laughs> uh, Emma is the uh, editor of I Do Not Seed, and ed Emma is going to read a poem from the chat book. Um, I'll introduce her more, more fully later because she's got another part to play. Yeah. Uh, but here she is with the most perfect poem, which is called yeah. And Sometimes... In my single bed. And sometimes in my single bed. I love the surge, volcanic urge, my fingers playing vulva music, deranging a ghostly yawny verse in pink folds. I warm my earth strings in the cleft, the cliff, the secret cleft, my lover left. Chin chin. That's rather nice. Mm. Is that the end of that poem? Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it went on a bit further. <laughs> oh. um, Marian, are you there? Yeah, should I am. We, should we now um, go towards you and Morrigan and Sarge and wait for Renee to arrive that way? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. You're going to look after this bit, eh? I am. <laughs> okay. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mary Ann Evans. I arrived here as an immigrant child from Manchester, and I live in Wellington on Ngāti Mutunga land. And I wasn't around when Heather was born 80 years ago, but I was a member of the Spiral Collective that published Heather's first collection, A Figurehead of Face, 40 years after that. Heather inspired me, showed me that though in, through engaging with collectivity that benefits everyone, it's possible for a lesbian single mother, artist and sub abuse survivor to build a richly productive life. And I'm wearing my gardening shirt today because I have often had problems with my wardrobe choices. So I thought, well, <laughs> okay, I'll do the garden shirt. <laughs> it's been a joy to collaborate with Emma and Biz on I Do Not Seed as a member of the three women collective that we had. It began with a 78 page manuscript I found in Heather's archives after Kushla Parakofa and I brought them to Wellington for deposit in the Turnbull Library. Spirals always prioritize supporting creators in the way they most want, standing beside them or behind them with much love. Commercial imperatives and ideological positions matter far less. And this project's no different. We knew Heather would love Jane Zuster's image of her on the cover, to have Renee to launch her new collection, and to have Tilly to MC. So a huge thank you to you all for making those wishes come true. And also many thanks to Rick McPherson, Heather's son, who has made reproducing the poems really, really easy. Oh, that's good. Mm. Opening and closing today, was a bit more of a challenge. And we took advice from among others, Morgan Sievers and Sage Gurney, Heather's very close friends as representatives of the lesbian community, 
that from the early 70s supported Heather as a writer and her collective initiatives like Spiral. They also supported individual and collaborative projects associated with artists like Ali Eagle, who died last week, and who we dearly miss today. She started her contribution for Heather, but didn't get to finish it. The incantation, the poem, that Heather might most have wanted to open this event wasn't available with good enough audio quality, but we think she'd be almost as happy if it would prioritize her own voice in another way at the beginning. And we know she would deeply appreciate Ren's offer to close this afternoon with a karakia. So a warm thank you to you too, Ren. Now, if I can do it with my sheer screen, here's Morrigan with Heather in the 90s. Whoops, I'm supposed to see my screen, but not that bit. Here we go. So here's Morrigan and Heather in the 90s, oh. with their, which I think shows the warmth of their relationship always. And the significance of Heather's long relationship with Morrigan and Sag is also illustrated by Morrigan's response to the manuscript for I Do Not See. <coughs> I was very moved reading Heather's poems, she wrote. <clears throat> poems new to me, but in many images I hear her voice echoing from decades past. The ideas refined and reworked and now speaking to us with such depth and knowledge. Brilliant. The rest of us who also love the poems don't have Morrigan's insight. It's a beautiful affirmation. And it's a privilege that Morrigan and Sage are with us today and Morrigan has kindly agreed to answer some questions about that 70s lesbian world the one that supported Heather and Spiral so strongly. So, are you there, Morrigan? Morrigan. No, I don't want it full screen because I want I'm it. sure I saw you before. Mm. Yes, you did see her. Mm. <laughs> it's muted. Unmute. Yes, I just had to unmute myself there. There you go. <laughs> Hello, Sedge. Unmute Hi. myself. Hello, Morgan. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about where you first met Heather um, and how you became so close? Yes, I, I can. I met. I remember it very well. I met Heather um, in Auckland at a party uh, in the early 60s, 62 or 3. And, uh, I was so attracted to her then, so gorgeous and interesting. And we started a conversation at that party that lasted for the next 50 plus years. And in the 70s, that friendship it developed into becoming lovers when we met uh, again in Christchurch. Although in the intervening time we had um, we had written letters and <clears throat> maintained contact as best you can in those days, pre um, messaging and so forth. So, so yes, with that, others, once you were both living in Christchurch, you started to establish a community. What kinds of activities did that involve and what roles did Heather have? Hmm. I just, um, I'd just like to go back a, a bit to look at that closeness that we had then, because um, I think it's important Heather's questioning um, about where were the others, and that was others, other writers, not, um, not we knew other lesbians, but um, we knew about Gertrude Stein, and but who else, and where was the reflection of ourselves? And this was Heather's constant searching and her curiosity and always her writing. And so, yes, to follow on from that, um, in a, um, by the mid 70s, Heather and I had negotiated becoming not lovers. And um, there was a small out lesbian community living closely in Christchurch at the time. That was including Ali Eagle and me and Sage here, um, just opposite, and Heather just around the corner. And we focused on our, um, in creating our own entertainments and amusements. And uh, that often was singing and dancing and, um, and partying in our own uh, living rooms. But one thing I like to remember particularly was the, was, the, was the play, the ongoing play we made about 
uh, going to uh, Lesbos or or somewhere, some place where lesbians um, could be as ourselves and not like how it was for us in the 70s Christchurch. Anyway, we took on all these different roles while we were on this fabulous journey to wherever it was. And Heather always liked to be the Grand Vizier. And I always <laughs> remember that because it is sitting there looking over her glasses as she did and um, always to be consulted. <laughs> and so there was, oh. Yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, and there were the, your other activities, which were about developing a spiritual practices, weren't there with Wicca? Oh, absolutely. And that was also reflected in her writing, wasn't it? You know, it was her explorations and her research. And um, a bit also we acted, we went down to the beach, we went at full moon the first time and uh, watched the full moon rise out of the sea and lit a fire and then we looked around at each other and thought now what do we do because we had no model but <coughs> we sang and danced and um and told stories and yeah we had our own connection with each other and to the elements and we were working out another way to experience our spirituality our female lesbian spirituality yeah there was so knowledgeable about the goddess the goddesses in all their aspects. And while all this was happening, Heather was also addressing the sexual abuse she'd survived. How did you learn about that? Hmm. One day Heather came around for a cuppa, as she was wont to do, neighbourly, and she just sat down and said she needed to tell me something. And she told me in graphic detail what her father had done to her as a young girl and I remember being shocked horrified but also in awe of her ability to sit there and tell me this abominable story and then she told me the group of sexual abuse survivors that she was um, working with had decided that that they would all go and tell their friends um, what had been done to them and that was the beginnings um, of the sexual abuse survivors groups, but you know, that was Heather. She had immense uh, courage, didn't she? Busting out secrets, pushing into all the hidden and sometimes dark places. She exposed things and she will gather up a storm of harpies, witches and eggs. <laughs> and through all this, through the building community and addressing the things in her own life and a little bit like the changes that she was talking about at the, when we heard her voice at the very beginning of this. Um, she was also writing and supporting other writers and artists and you supported Heather in that work, the lesbian community supported that work even though the work wasn't only with lesbian writers. Yes, she cast her net wide and she was there as a support for any number of people, lesbians and women. And yes, we were all there. I would say we supported each other. Um, I suppose I provided a space, um, as did Ali, for gatherings. You know, we made each other cups of tea. We were part of a network of support and discussion. And it was, it was a collaboration, really. And we also looked after each other's children uh, and she had emotional support, didn't we? Mm. Yeah. It was Is there a, anything you'd uh, like to add to that, Sage? Because I know that Spiral also published your book, Amazon Songs, in the 80s. So you were a writer. How was Heather for you in your writing? She supported me uh, and encouraged me. and helped me to get my book published by writing all the foreword. Yeah. I think I think she just supported so many women mm. and um, of so many different kinds. And um, it's just lovely to be able to celebrate her today. 
Thank you, Morrigan. Is there anything else you want, either of you want to add? No, no, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Morrigan and Saj. Um, we're still having a little bit of trouble getting hold of Renee, so. I'm going uh, to bring her to Lee. Yes, Emma. So you just keep going. Yeah, Emma, could you maybe ring her? Yeah, I thought I saw her. She, there she is. She's here. Oh, <laughs> you see her. Oh, that's beautiful. Renee, are you ready to be introduced? I'm ready. Uh, you, Renee, you might be on mute. She's not. I can't hear him. She's not talking yet. So she's defo there. Okay. Will I um, read the will I read the poem remembering early while she gets organized? Great. Yep. Cool. Uh -huh. Um this one is to accompany um uh, Morgan and Sag, and it's about that time in the 70s. Um remembering early. The heady year is Beltane, Sawan, Lamas. We sprinkled a salt circle in the sand and ranged for driftwood and lit the bonfire and hummed and croned and screeched and chanted many a wild wicked tune and prayed and split a red cheeked apple to break old spells and make new toasts and hold hands praising dry and bloody bodies and stroking lately healed griefs in newfound goddess spirit relief. Kia ora. Oh, thank you. Uh, Renee, are you with us? Can you hear us? Okay, we're going to do some background uh, family uh, mustering. We'll, we'll just do some family, family mustering in the background and we'll move to Fran Mano. And while Fran is talking, there'll be a little bit of stuff happening in the background to collect Renee. So could I introduce Fran Mano, please? Uh, Fran, Fran is a later in life artist who taught in the painting department of Elam School of, Mu of Fine Arts in Auckland for several years while also completing a master's and a doctorate of fine arts. She's had many exhibitions, some solo, some part of the lesbian art group Pulse Art. Her focus has always been a lesbian feminist one, which explores lesbian visibility in art and interrogates the prevalence of male art culture, which uh, still exists, unsurprisingly, at Elam. Fran, Fran has retired, but still maintains a presence in the Auckland art scene. She, along with other Pulse Art members, she is a robust delight in foregrounding lesbian narratives, sometimes obscure, and sometimes blatant in the exhibitions. Please welcome Fran Mano. Do I click on myself? Um, you should be there. Yeah, you're there full screen. You just oh, fire here. Oh, okay. Great. I'll um, just say that Paul, yeah. Dr. Hugh, I don't think so. Um, I was just going to say that Pulse Art, Pulse Art Group, the lesbian Pulse Art Group, has been going now for nearly 23 years and having exhibitions most years. So. Anyway, Heather wrote reviews of Pulse Art exhibitions. They were poetic, sometimes challenging, a little elusive and obscure as poetry can be, but always lively and insightful. She's also written poems about my paintings, I haven't got one here, but I'm going to put it onto the Spiral Collective page. Um, particularly of very large lesbian faces, and Prue's got one. She would come to my studio and sit and observe and write about the work. Then she'd give me first drafts and ask for comments. This is yeah. from her response to an upcoming yeah. exhibition called The Paper. Good night. <laughs> you, <laughs> painter who make us a face, a place, we aging, raging, acerbic, painted woman, who make, unmake, remake our roles. You, painter, 
who judging us turn us judges, changing faces and shifty moons. Your gift Great. of presence turns us briefly immortal. When Heather moved into the flat in our row in my, my garden 20 years ago, our friendship became more varied. Not just my paintings, but also everyday life, the garden, gossip, and always somehow discussions about getting older and associated health problems. <laughs> um, when we lived next door to Heather, we, along with other friends, often socialized together. So many of Heather's more recent poems reflect memories of our shared garden, along with small day-to-day -day happenings. Fascinating to see these moments enlivened by a poet's eye. And I'm just going to read, can you see that? I think it came up at the beginning. Look at you. Anyway. It's called A Happy Birthday yeah. Meditate for Fran. And yeah. instead of writing comments all over it saying, what do you think? Do you think this is good enough? I'll do it again. She drew lots of pictures. And it goes it. like, yes. Dogs. Yes. <laughs> hang on, I'm just finding it. Here it is. A happy Birthday Meditate for Fran. Seven years I've lived in your garden, not in the blueberry prickly, not in the strawberry leaves, not even next to the pomegranates. Under a roof, not a tree, I peer through gray diamond trellis at greenery, grabbing glimpses of gardeners and sky and birds and other partakers of fruit du jour and etymology. Here I weep and rage and grieve and heal in richly eloquent privacy. Here times I look at your drawings. Here, times, your drawings look back. We feed elliptical dialogue, quick parries and weird texts. When we get together to share a meal, we talk, we joke and laugh about family, and secrets and lovers and bits of our pasts. Whether it's part of now or apart from or part from then, there is a dimension that shifts and pales and darkens and ends and swells again. A sort of invisible moon, a rainbow splashed garden reflection. This befits a friend, love from Heather. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Fran. That's okay. Oh, that's great. Um, now we have some music, I think. Uh, where's Marion? I'm here. Yeah. Are I'm we gonna... here and Renee will be coming shortly. Great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, so are we going to have a little piece of music and then go to Adrian Martin or are we going straight to Adrian? Let's go straight to Adrian. Okay. Are uh, you ready? Are you ready I'm... to be introduced, yeah. Adrian? Yes. Um, Adrian Martin today began exploring portraiture for portra photographing friends in her Sydney flat yeah. in the late 70s and then set up a portrait studio back in Dunedin in 1980. She staged uh, sittings in the deserted rooms at, at Dunedin's historic Excelsior Hotel. In 1985, she relocated to Auckland, where in 1986, she was commissioned by the National Art Gallery to photograph her series, Artist Portraits. A survey of her portraiture was first shown at the Dunedin Public Art Gallery in 1988. Adrian is Wellington-based. Her work is held in major New Zealand public collections, including Te Papa, the Auckland, Christchurch and Dunedin Art Galleries, the Douse, the Sargent and more. And Adrian currently has a show running at a new gallery called NV6011 on Garrett Street in Wellington. Please welcome Adrian. Hi. First, first of all, I just wanted to um, uh, acknowledge um, Morrigan. Can you hear me, Morrigan? Oh well. Um, 
because I, yes. I I can I can now. Hi, do do you from, remember me? I do. I remember you very well uh, from well, Christchurch. I, I I remember when I was living in Sydney and I popped over to New Zealand for a little holiday to see my family and I went up to Christchurch and I was introduced to you and Ellie and your little cottage. Um, I think it was by a mutual friend called, was it Robin Black? Sorry, yeah. my memory, memory yeah. fails me. I, I, I'm the same. But I, I really vividly remember um, sitting in, in your cottage and um, talking with the both of you. And um, yeah, and on Friday, uh, just a couple of days ago, I attended. Um, Ali's graveside and it was very very moving and um it was um sad and unbelievable I mean I didn't know that she'd been ill and so it was just very sudden for me um but I had we had been in touch occasionally over the years and I had photographed her at uh, Mokopakaki gallery in 2018 uh, sitting at her easel um, kind of looking like um, a figure in a Vermeer painting um, where she was at her easel and um, painting but anyway so I just wanted to acknowledge Ali acknowledge you Morrigan and acknowledge my connection with the both of you then um, Thank heading you. to yeah Thank you. That was 1974. It was it was around the time of the Commonwealth Games. Um, right. so, so it's really lovely to see you. And you. Yeah. Um, so with with Heather, I have been trying to track my memory. When did I first meet Heather? And it's very vague. I, I'm absolutely unsure. Uh, I'm actually unsure. But I do have two key memories and one is where I owned this um, huge American gas guzzler of a car called um, a Rambler Classic <laughs> and I was traveling from Wellington to Dunedin in it and I stopped in to see her um, at her house in I think it was January 1981 and she said, do you mind taking me and my son to, I think it was near Geraldine, uh, uh, to see a friend of hers called Alice? Does that mean anything to anybody? Anyway, um, so we drove. And a, and a, it was a really hot summer's day. And we were on this long trip uh, to Geraldine. And then we arrived at the... Um, at the at the location, it was a sort of a farmhouse on a hill over the long driveway, and I went. My eyes nearly popped out of my head because this Alice was the Alice that I knew when I lived in Sydney years before. Um, but we weren't that close. In fact, we were kind of a little bit like that to the point where I was banished to the shed to sleep the night. <laughs> <laughs> and Heather and her son went into the inside we were nice and warm. Anyway, Heather handled that very well. It was a very awkward situation requiring enormous diplomacy. And um, Heather was um, superb at that. And anyway, I next day drove back. Then my next memory is of um, seeing her in... Um, in Christchurch um, briefly where I stopped off in her flat um, and she invited me to stay the night and we had a, we had dinner we had this long conversation and um, I then declared I was a portrait photographer photographing artists and friends within the environmental structures of architecture because I really love the formalism and the abstraction of that but then I declared to her quite suddenly over a glass of wine I'm going to photograph faces. I was very emphatic, still am, but anyway, <laughs> more so then. I said, I'm going to photograph faces. And um, and so we went into this long discussion about the face. And um, from then on, I then 
really, really was encouraged by her, by her response to photograph faces. And from there, I created my face shot of Joanna Paul the, the following year. And we have Heather to thank for that. It's, it's, a, it's a celebrated image, not being egotistical, but I have enjoyed it. Um, it's been collected and reproduced. And then while when I got this email about contributing to this talk about Heather and would I like to say something, my first thought was uh, to Marion was, I wished I'd photographed her. And I never did, obviously. And then Heather asked me to explain why I didn't or why I did, or I can't remember now what, what Heather's, uh, uh, Marion's question was. Um, but the thing that um, I regretted not recording was her, her beauty and her intelligence and her gravitas and her style and her little glasses. And um, I thought, my God, I could have made a fantastic portrait of her. And I never did. And that's my regret. There we have it. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Adrian. I regret it too. I think we all do. Now, Marion, can I ask you, should we, should we keep moving forward? I think um, we'll keep moving forward and <laughs> Renee will get here when she gets here. Okay, cool. Okay, so thank you, Adrian. Unless and everybody would like a little break. Is it a moment just people want to get up and go and have a pee or a drink or something? No, I'm happy to carry on listening. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep going. Okay, Sue Fitchard, are you ready to be introduced? Well, Sue Fitchard is a conversation conservationist, well, and a conversationist, and a Waiheke Islander. She's the co-author and editor of several poetry books and anthologies. She also Palava Lava Queen and On the Wing and a collaborative work with artist Jane Zostis, uh, Charts and Sounding, Some Small Navigation Aids. Uh, which was published under the Spiral imprint in New Zealand and the Spinifex Press imprint in Australia. Works appeared in various publications in New Zealand, US, Australia, Germany, Korea, and in art shows. So as I say, she is very proud to have had work appear in anthologies alongside Heather McPherson's work and to identify as lesbian feminists who both contributed to Broadsheet. Please welcome Sue Fitcher. Where is Sue? Yeah. Hmm. So it's a bugger. Oh. Muted. Am I unmuted? Am I muted? Oh. Here, oh, you are. Are. Here we are. Here we are. Welcome, um, Sue. Yeah. Did I? Did you hear anything I said? <laughs> Just a little bit okay. about. I'll um, start again. Yeah. Kia ora koutou. Um, I'd really like to acknowledge that it's the week of Heather's birthday, so it's an important, uh, important week. And I'd also like to acknowledge her as a founding member of the Spiral Collective, uh, which Marion has already acknowledged. Um, she was an activist writer, and she inspired inspired other lesbian feminist writers like myself. And I'd really like to give thanks on behalf of all writers who've um, benefited from the Spiral Collective. And in fact, my one of my co-authors, Jane, Cura Jane, um, is, is here who benefited from, from that connection with Spiral. But, but Heather was a, a pioneer for us and uh, for me. And um, I'd really, really, it's so good to see Heather's woman special, woman very, very specially woman oriented and fully crafted poetry. And it continues to be available in the public arena. So even though we've lost Heather, her work is still refreshed and renewed. And I really love that. Um, 
I'd really like to honour her work as a fellow poet. And so I'm going to read um, her work, Sniffing the Roses, which was in the book um, that was recently published called The Joyous Chaotic Place. Um, this is a poem that um, I've always loved because I've always loved the idea of metamorphosis. And in this particular poem, Heather takes us on a really wildly imaginative ride of possibility. So um, I hope you all enjoy it. Sniffing the roses, poking my nose in roses, I metamorphose into a wasp, a bumblebee, an aged dyke in a ditch, a broomstick witch, whose eternity is to stretch into plaiting, just drop petals as linings for pliant, pliant rose nests exuding hundreds of dusk smeared scents. Or maybe like Rip Van Winkle, I'll wake hog-eyed, hairy-faced, and be wildly transfixed in some garden, waving a telegram from the queen and assigning my longevity to frequent guzzling of hot pink rose blood. Mixed maybe with bulging pomegranate juices, violent as honey gatherers' suns that blaze through volcanic dust, while visitants hungry three greys, a bee stung calyx. And somebody enterprising bottles rose breath, for when reality needs a slant, or blood needs mopping up, or desolate lost loves and family face nightmares. We become a butterfly, waffling a dotly drunken sun dance up a trellis, before a sudden blackbird swoops low and snaps. No, no, first we dream. We end up transposed into a rose. It's the end. Oh, thank you, Sue Fitchett. You're a beautiful reader of poetry. I've always thought that. Um, so um, now we're going to move forward to Debbie Jones, who I saw here just before. Uh, so Debbie, are you okay to be introduced? Debbie Jones is a lifetime feminist, a scholar, writer, and researcher, an ex-academic, quietly recovering, and wondering what comes next. Debbie writes, I was lucky to get to know Heather in the 90s when I was teaching at Waikato University. Please welcome Debbie Jones. Thanks, Kira Tilly. And mm. a big respect, Marion, to you and the other women of Spiral who over the years have done this um, precious, important work of, of publishing Heather's poetry. We Thank owe you, Debbie. A, a great debt. And there's so much love, isn't there, in the work that you do supporting each other. So, yes, I was really lucky to meet Heather and Kira Ruth. I've seen Ruth Bush somewhere here. And it is um, through Ruth that I first met Heather um, when I was living in Hamilton in the 90s. She was living with Ruth. So, thank you, Ruth. And I guess at that time, Hamilton was a particular kind of hotbed of feminism, uh, a lot of it at the university, but also beyond. A lot of it focused around the lesbian feminist community, but not only. Because it was a small town, there was a, a, a moment where there was a wonderfully kind of brilliant, quite diverse, warm, supportive, um, yeah, feminist hotbed, which was just a wonderful place to be at the time. And it was in that context that I met Heather and got to know her as a friend, and we would get together and talk about writing as well. I want to prioritise reading um, Heather's poem, but just about Heather as a person, and you know, I'm, as I guess other people here are, you're feeling her presence and how wonderful it was to hear her voice earlier and, you know, her wonderful, uh, clever, humorous eyes. 
um, beneath, behind those glasses and her beautiful voice, her intelligence. And the thing that I would like to mention as I experienced here, that was her kindness. Very fierce, um, challenging, and also very kind. And I really benefited from her kindness to me. So I'm going to read the poem again, also from a um, joyful, chaotic place. Uh, and this is the garden poems from which the beautiful roses poem came that we just heard. And it's to Ursula Bethel. And it, as Morrigan and others have emphasized, Heather was very aware of and sought and, and built and developed and through others created her sense of a heritage as, um, in particular, as a lesbian poet. And Ursula Bethel, um, the poet from Christchurch was a really important part of that for her. And in this collection of garden poems, Ursula, she visits her grave, Ursula's grave, at both at the beginning and the end. And this is a poem called Ursula Bethel. She calls her here, Miss Bethel. So, Ursula Bethel. A poet of lyric and spiritual persuasion <coughs> who built Rye's cottage on Cashmere Hill. Miss Bethel looked out on the Canterbury Plains. Her living companion was Effie Pollen. Miss Bethel planted dwarf mandarins, roses, exotics, veggies, bulbs. She carted rocks for a small rock garden and wrote and taught and entertained. Outside one day, while earnestly digging, she lifted her head and gazed at the Alps and suddenly saw an utterly new magnificence and wrote the mountains, rivers, plains, their fluctuant beauty and longevity as one who, after Effie died, fully knowing grief and loss, with a lover's tender breath, divined an artist's love of land we squabble to be guardians of. Three, Heather. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really cool. I love what you said too about Heather's voice. It was um, just the most wonderful thing. Um, Miriam. Not unlike yours, Tilly. No, oh, no. Hers, no, I think Heather's had more, you know, resonating uh, intelligence. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> uh, Heather, um, Marion, are we uh, are we, we are ready for approaching arrival? Uh, Renee okay. Zoom is just being uh, updated You're so that she can get through. I'm here. Oh, no. Look, here she is. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Biz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, welcome, Renee. Thank you. you. Are you ready, Renee, for me to introduce you? To you do are, I am. Okay. I am. Okay. Renee is Nati Kahanunu and Gordon Clan, a dramatist, poet, novelist, short story writer, and blogger of Wednesday Busk, which probably all of us here listen and uh, read every Wednesday. And Renee lives in Otaki. At age 50, she wrote her first play, her first play, Setting the Table which kick-started four decades of feminist, class, and race consciousness storytelling for stage and page. Renee is a living legend and has received numerous fellowships and awards, including the ONZM, the Play Market Award, the PM's Award for Literary Achievement, and the King Ehaka Award for Service to Toi Māori. Her recent memoir is These Two Hands, released in an updated and uh, expanded second edition and like the first is a bestseller. Renee's second crime novel Blood Matters is going to hit the shops uh, later this year. Please welcome Renee to launch Heather's book. <laughs> now can you see me? We yeah. can. I can. Okay, let's go. Ko whaka punaki te manga, ko wairo te awa, ko takatimu te waka, ko kahanunu te iwi, 
Corinne Takawingawa. Kia everyone. Better late than never. <laughs> it's a great pleasure and an honour to be here to launch I Will Not Seed, a collection of poems by Heather McPherson. Thank you to Marian Evans for all her help, who made allowances for my failing eyesight and trusted me with an e-copy of the collection so I was able to read and reread these poems while writing these words. Thank you, Marion, and also thanks to Tilly, Emma, and Biz. Sometimes, as Blanche says in Streetcar Named Desire, we depend upon the kindness of strangers, mm -hmm. but I am luckier than Blanche. I depend on the kindness of whanau and friends. When I came onto the scene in Auckland in 1980, Heather in Christchurch had already, with others, formed the collective spiral. I knew what spiral meant, or I thought I did. Something winding round and round, like when I spun, spun one of those pine cones I, we gathered for the wood in Coal Range, because they burned fiercely and were free for the gathering. Sometimes as a kid, I played with one, trying to make it spin, mostly failing, but sometimes once in a hundred tries, perhaps succeeding. A euphoric moment, a sweet success. And there, and the image of that little cone spinning round and round, stopping, teetering, falling, then being still, waiting for the next lot of fingers to make it spiral, has remained with me, a useful as well as enchanting image. Spiral, I mused. Spiral. Then I thought, collective. Before 1972, when Broadsheet, the feminist magazine, began to be published, I'd not come across that word. Collective. Before the 70s, I'd also not come across the feminist termination to discuss everything before acting. By the 80s, when I came to Auckland, it was the word. The idea that everyone's point of view should be considered before taking action was totally new to me. Up until then, I'd used the do it because I say so approach. <laughs> In a collective, though, I discovered, it was essential to discuss every possible move before acting. I understood the principle that everyone's point of view should be discovered, discussed, included. It was the practice I found difficult. I'm not sure I ever got the hang of it. <laughs> it seemed to me that Heather totally understood the concept. And what is even better, was happy to put it into practice. The collective support and work on behalf of Kerry Hume, the Bone People, and Jackie Stern, the House of Talking Cat, among others, as well as the advice and encouragement of women writers makes that clear. She understood that being a writer, an artist, is a solitary business, a group enterprise at other times. And she knew with great certainty that you're in it for the long haul. If you write for theatre or a group endeavour, writing can also be communal. Other workers, actors, singers, dancers, can comment and make suggestions, which you either accept or don't. Sometimes you ask for help, like I did, and when I asked Jess Hook, the late, very dear Jess Hawke Oakenstar, to write me a song with the first words, Dear Gertrude Stein. She handed it to me the next day. Poetry, said Heather, is political. She understood the value of words. She understood how important it was for people like me to see that other despised, scary, wonderful word lesbian was also political. It was, it was about, it was also political. She said it, she wrote it, and she also wrote about its sexuality and its combination of frivolity, friendship, and formidable purpose. We're here 
and we're not going away. Sometimes writing goes round and round in a circle, and other times you go like a rocket towards the target. There's such a thing, no such thing as inspiration. There's only working and reworking, working and reworking. And somehow a time comes when you know the piece is, of work is finished or as finished as it's ever going to be. While the 1980s was a freeing and fun decade for a lot of us, it was also hard work. It was a hard working time. You said you'd do something and you did it. Other women, friends, or sometimes strangers depended on you. So you squared your shoulders and got on with it. It seemed to me the 80s was a decade made up of a mixture of learning, hard work and pleasure, and that Heather was an integral part of that. She did not rely on the male literary establishment for either approval or acceptance. It was unimportant, a noisy little squib quacking to itself out there somewhere. She was a, a shock and a surprise to their artificial and cozy beliefs. She was a mover and a shaker of old certainties, a friend to many, a lover to some, a loving and loved mother and grandmother, an artist and a writer, a star. She was pointed, she pointed the way for not only other lesbians, but for all writers, all female writers everywhere. I will not seed. And who but Heather could use that fabulous four-letter word, seed? A beautiful word, a powerful word. Here is a wordswoman spinning her craft, a weaver of words, all lengths, all twists and softnesses, her kit is full of words, all sizes and shapes, strong and hard, fragile and loving. She gathers them, harvests them, presents them for our future and always delight. Wrapped around us, we can wrap them around us as a shield and a haven. Sister, when you pick sapphic fragments out of my body from under your words, words from under your body, and after you shake out other assumptions of sights and times and ignorances, will you recollect me? Will you document me in your blooming Olivia tree? Adrian Rich wrote, there must be those amongst whom we can sit down and weep and still be regarded as warriors. Heather Avis McPherson was that kind of warrior. She knew our weaknesses, she knew our strengths, and in I Will Not Seed, her words are an inspiration and an arrow. The road to warmth and safety is simply in ourselves. Who are we? Who we are? I am very happy to declare I Will Not Seed by Heather McPherson, published by Spiral, edited Emma Lyon, Emma Lyon, sorry, cover design, Biz Heyman, well and truly launched. <laughs> oh, Kiwara Renee, thank you very hey. much. Hey, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't nice see you, darling, but I can hear you. I mean, it's not, it's not the screen, it's, it's not anything to do with Zoom, it's me, but I can hear you. Thank, Thank you. you, Renee. Thank you, Renee. <laughs> um, uh, I love what you said. I wish it could be printed somewhere. Uh, well, I can give it to Marion. Yes, okay. you can put it on the spiral site. That would be wonderful. Oh, it was oh, so beautiful, was Renee. Well, oh, Marion can do that. I'll probably muck it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, that'd be really cool. Um, now, I've been looking secretly across the screen to see if Fiona's here and if she's not. So um, the next thing to do was to be Fiona talking about Heather's work 
Um, and as a backup, because Fiona's actually out at the airport at the moment, uh, Emma was going to uh, read this work for us. Emma, are you all ready to go? Yep, all ready. So this is with thanks to Dame Fiona Kidman, who shared this with me as she couldn't be here today. I first met Heather at the United Women's Convention in 1975 on a day of howling winds, sleety rain, and among 2,000 undaunted women. We clicked straight away. Life was hard for Heather at that time, hard for mothers, and we had a deep, long conversation about this and about discrimination. Before long, I had got to know her through her poems. As we women circled the motu in those years when we were discovering our true selves, we would see each other at readings, and I was discovering Heather's beautiful poems. We didn't see a lot of each other over those past years, geographical distance, jobs, and so on. But from time to time, we would be in touch and her poems still sing and reach me. Loving memories of you, dear Heather, the words sing on, Fiona. Kia ora. Tilly has gone. Oh, 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 was that the end of that? <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just making a quick trip to the airport. <laughs> I thought it would take longer and then I would have time, you know, to meet the client. Um, <laughs> Oh, thank you, Emma. Um, okay, Ariwa, are you ready for? Um, are you ready to come on? I'll introduce you. Ariwa McLeod is a senior lecturer in the English department, Uni Auckland University, from 1969 to 05. She focused on 19th and 20th century women writers. Heather's 1982 collection, A Figurehead, a Face, was the first out lesbian collection in. New Zealand, Aotearoa. Uh, Rewa writes, I loved these powerful, strong, angry, feminist poems. I loved reading them aloud. I got to know her well when she moved up to Auckland and into the flat in the garden behind the villa. She would write poems on special occasions for my partner Fran and myself, witty, amusing, domestic poems that were called the garden poems. Some of which Janet Sharman, who I see here today, collected into this joyous, chaotic place. Please welcome Arewa. Oh, she's not at the airport, is she? Unmute. Ah, yes, unmute. Up at the top by your picture. Or it's down cool. on the left. There, there you are. Yeah, there you are. Where? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know where I am, but it's a pleasure to see Renee after reading her blogs once a week, to actually see her in person, and to think that I was I was teaching Renee at about the same time as as uh, Heather was writing some of these poems, and we heard Heather. At the beginning of this session, reading from a figurehead, a face, which was 1882, which was her first collection of poetry, and, I, and she said in the introduction to that, I said, "Shall we do what she said?" She said, seven years ago, when as a writer with a fairly traditional style, I changed my political commitment and lifestyle, I felt initially stranded in a kind of poetic homelessness." On the one hand, I wanted to make a new start to clear out the patriarchy in my head. On the other hand, I wanted to redefine such emotionally charged concepts as woman and lesbian with their pejorative accretions. Well, 1982, when this collection came out, it was the first out lesbian poetry to be published in New Zealand. And that passage she read marked a real change, I think, in New Zealand women's poetry. Let's read a bit of it. Time and again, 
Time and again, I've tried to write a goddess poem. Now that I have fleshed the lyric tongue, a poem stirs. It breaks from its inhabitants. Red shapes blaze in the patchwork world. There are two women naked on a bed. And then the poem continues. Such proximity is heretical and a sin to theologians and borough councillors. Their voices shake the bed boardrooms. Bearded ones look stonily from blazoned coats of arms. Thick carpet corridors choke between the walls. And we strip absolution. We have become our own theologians and counselors. Our skins are moonwashed. Our laughter escalates. And these are very, they're vibrant and they're strong poems. And they're great poems to read aloud. Um, in fact, here's a rather lengthy one, which I'll just read a bit of. For her 36th year, a breakout, which presumably was written when it was 36. This is the rage of a burning woman. This is the rage of her rising. This is the rage of a woman who did 36 years time in a coffin break. This is the rage of a woman broken out of a box, broken out of nails, bars, tight forms, breaking into a new improbable image, tossing off that hunched apologetic loiterer on the edge, crumpling that skin a torn singlet for hot water covered rags, filling her lungs with air. This is the rage of a woman spun in long night voices, long night cells, who finds as she blinks in the sun that the manhole and its grating cut off shoots and she old clothes peg came to life outside. What should I do with this rage swelling in my belly, a red fist? This is the rage of a woman with a millennium to disturb. This woman finds a lineage of survivors who boiled coppers in the wash house once a week, who chopped sticks and spread their long and plaited hair to dry, who read by moonlight, read, sorry, who read by candlelight and rode for miles to dance, who sometimes imagined glories more vast and could be seen standing on country roads late at night, urging visions for the dark hills, whose bulk is more mysterious than sky, whose outline nudges a solid memory of one immovable time. Those women, startling at a white shape on the fence, a more pork that flies off one legend says to death. Those women turning back to a flaked veranda to face the photographer unsmiling from the folds of a gathered gown. It's, this is actually that's just a section of a much longer poem. As I said, I love reading it aloud. It's got this excitement that doesn't want the reader to stop. Um, it is the excitement and debate of the shared feminism of those, those days. Um, the shared emergent feminism, this is the 70s, and I think these are these are actually her great poems that I think Heather actually agreed with me. I said to her once, I think these are your most your best work. And Heather said in 1988, it seems to me now that my most innovative work was done between 1975 and 1979. I was going to read the Ursula Bethel poem, but no. <laughs> Sue, Sue, Sue beat me to it. It was a Beat me to it. Beat me to it. Um, yeah. Um, and we, I knew Heather for over 20 years when she moved up to Auckland and moved into the garden flat at the back of, back of our house. So a lot of the poems are collected in the last collection, this joyous, chaotic place, so, so beautifully worked out by um, Janet Charman. Thank you, Arewa. Thank you very much. Francis, don't keep looking at me. Okay. <laughs> so we to keep checking. No, no, we knew, we knew thank we you. We did so well as a, as a pair. <laughs> yeah. She had, on to dinner. she had us around to dinner. And yeah. our two dogs got on very well together. Two small dogs. Mm. Okay, the next piece is a duet. Renee, you've already met, but I'd like to introduce Biz. 
Biz Heyman is an artist, design historian, and teacher based in Aotearoa. Biz has taught and researched art and design at universities, art schools, and the local community in the UK and across Australia and New Zealand. Ceramics is a return to her original medium, uh, first encountered at school, and Biz hand builds from sections altered after they've been thrown on the wheel. Most of the work has an abstract meaning or is made with certain symbolic functions in mind. Biz writes of a love of using the time-honoured traditional technique of throwing to pursue radical fresh forms, to see something on the wheel head or the banding wheel and the workbench that she's never or we've never seen before. Biz's teaching is now about supporting the creativity of others uh, but Biz also develops websites and is a book jacket designer and was on the collective with Emma and Marion to produce the audiobook I Do Not Seed. So please welcome Renee in conversation with Biz. <laughs> Kia ora, Biz. Kia ora. What, what made you, what, what attracted you to the project? Why did you, did you, like, was it, of course you would have read it, was it the work or the idea of this, that came from the work for you or? It was being asked to do it. Was um, it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, until that point, I'd never, I'd never, I have to be honest, I had never even heard of Heather. First time I'd ever heard of, and so it was, um, it was, it was being in connection with Marion. Yes. Who, who knows Kim, my mm -hmm. partner sitting over there. Um, and yeah, I, I was just very, um, very grateful to have been asked in. And it just, I mean, it appealed straight away. Um, I, had, I hadn't really sort of a thought about, I'm not necessarily a poetry person. And it was, uh, but just straight away, the words were just incredible. They were so different from everything I've ever heard before. Um, and the absolute clincher was hearing early versions of the audio done by Ema. Mm. And I was just transported. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and um, so how did you go on about choosing the, the cover or the design or whatever, you know? It was a complete collaboration, you know, between the three of us. We would have regular Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. And well, good luck with it. <laughs> <laughs> Itself a learning process. <laughs> and um, yeah, no, it, it was, uh, I mean, just, I was given so much material and it just, it's one of those gorgeous projects that just creates itself, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. imagery, we went through several different iterations um, and it got to the point where it was quite difficult to make a decision between what image to use. You know, it was an embarrassment of riches, but we settled on um, an image um, created from a series made by Jane Zusters in 1975. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And um, there was just this stunning image. Well, there were some stunning ones um, of, of Heather at her kitchen table and looking directly into the camera. And there was just so much strength there. And it just went with that, I do not seed. Mm, yes. It was a no-brainer. Great title, isn't it? Oh, yeah. 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 Great yeah. title to work with. Too. Yes, yes. And and um, it's something like we often think, I often think anyway, there are I don't use those words. And what it's done for me is just given, I, I didn't really, I must have read the word. Mm. I must have over the years mm. and all the reading I've mm. done. I don't think I've ever said it out loud before mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, I saw it. Mm. And it's so perfect. <sighs> Another four letter word we can yes. use. <laughs> <laughs> we can all use this. Yes. And you can use this on the bus or something. <laughs> yes. If we Seed. Thank you. Thank you. Miss, do you want to talk a little bit about the typeface? Because mm. I hadn't known that there were women who created yeah. typefaces until you told me. I was going yeah. to ask about that. The, this, was a, this was funny. I don't know why, in the lead up to us ever talking about this project, I've become really interested in who makes typeface. I'm fast, I've always been really interested in fonts. Um, and yeah, I had been recently become aware, I don't know why, around how few women have created font. I mean, it's a real labor of love um, in the design world. It's a very, very specific side of, of design. Um, it takes a long time to make an entire set of typeface. 
Um, but as soon as I was getting the gist of what was going on with Heather, I just thought I've got to do it from her handwriting. You know, it's got to be from her. And so we had um, you and I, Marion, we went off to the Alexander Turnbull Library and we spent just a gorgeous day in there. Um, uh, I took a lot of food. We accessed the documents. I know that you, you've assisted getting into the library um, and just witnessing just the many different forms that Heather's handwriting was taking. Mm -hmm. You know, I could, like we've, we've all got our posh writing, haven't we? We've all got our, um, you know, scribble something quickly on the kitchen pad handwriting. And it was lovely to see that range across. Um, so yeah, I, um, I lifted from having captured all that info, took it home, put it through a, um, a, a vector um, graphics program, um, and then put, uploaded that all up into the um, into the wider project. But I really had fun with that. It's a bit of a cheat because I only did literally the letters that I do not, I do not see. I didn't do any other letters. <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> but yeah, I really enjoyed it. You also used a feminist, the rest of the time. Oh it? yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, the the other the other typeface that appears on on the the cover is written by was designed by. Trying to remember her name now. Susan Carre. Thank you, thank you, Susan Carr, who was one of the. Um, she was one of the first people to be employed at. Uh, at Apple Mac, Apple, you know, when the, she was, I think she was employee number 10 or something. And Gosh. she's been, yeah, she's, she's, she's the one who devised all the early Apple iconography. And she made um, a typeface called Geneva, which is free um, for use, you know, um, on your Apple Mac. Um, and it's, it's like, you know, um, it was Apple's own version of Helvetica, which is, you know, passionately loved by so many designers and I just love the fact that this is a female version yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that just seemed really important that all the elements that were on the page they yeah. had to be you know um so much of it was a collaboration you know both you know between the three of us you know ongoingly but also just you know the, the collaboration like an assumed a collab you know collaboration of course um with Susan and Heather's own writing, you know, mm, Heather yes. in her own work. Yes, you know? yes. And I love playing with the idea that um, I I do not seed. It's a triangle. It's a pyramid, this really strong shape. Um, and again, another strong start, yes, you know, I yes. do not seed. Oh, I, yes, that one, no. two, three, four. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes, it was yeah, just, yeah. It, again, it just designed itself. Mm. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Biz. Thank you, Renee. And I'm not quite sure who that other person is there. It's Kim. Oh, this oh, is this Kim. Is my friend Kim, or yeah. and uh, business partner Kim. Yep. Yeah. Right. yeah. She's oh, a great partner. You. She's a <laughs> horticulturist. She prunes my roses, and she writes great crime novels. Right. That's oh, right. You, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Hey, um, aren't we moving on now to where, Renee, you have a dialogue with Emma? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Emma, you've heard twice, has um, read a couple of poems, but you don't know much about her yet, so I'll just tell you a little wee thing. Emma Lyons is from East Cork, and she's been living in Aotearoa for nearly 10 years. She's a postdoctoral fellow in Irish studies at the Centre for Irish and Scottish. Her creative and critical work has been published worldwide. Please welcome this duet to talk editing and more, which will segue into a poem. Thank you. Kia ora. <laughs> Where are you? Which one? There. Yeah. Oh, can't <laughs> 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 So um, you um, wrote the introduction and uh, for I will not seed. And why why did you um, why did you feel um, attracted to the work, to Heather's work? Because I understand that you knew it before or somehow had come across it and 
Uh, so tell us about that. Yes, well, thank you. It's so incredible to be here with all of you. And I um, I came across Heather's work in 2017 when I started my um, PhD in the English program here. And my supervisors were Jacob Edmund and Emma Neal. And Emma, I was talking to Emma about this Irish lesbian poet, Mary Dorsey. And she was the first Irish lesbian to be published in Ireland in 1982. And then um, Emma said, so was Heather McPherson. And she gave me Yellow Pencils, that anthology. And so from there, I met Bridie Lonnie, who was exceptional. And I have so many treats. I have the original, I have the original Spiral magazines here. I have <laughs> poems from Heather. And then um, um, Bridie put me in contact with Marion. And I was checking my emails earlier. And it was 20, um, August 2018. It was the first time that we had contact. And since then, um, Marion and I have worked together and she's shown me some of Heather's unpublished poetry. And for me, with Heather, the main attraction was class, a conversation about class, a conversation about money, a conversation about the difficulties of money, something that I thought was extremely lacking in, in New Zealand, conversations about money or how people made money or the difficulties of making money. Um, and as someone who came from West Cork and from um, a working class background, it was something that I was missing, that conversation. And I also loved the um, complete honesty around rage about being enraged and about expressing that rage so honestly um and it was all of those things that drew me to heather and unfortunately i came in contact with heather's work just after she had died emma had spoken to emma neil had spoken to heather um about her contribution to manifesto a few weeks before um emma put me in contact with heather's work and heather died um not long after that oh. um, Mm. so I didn't get the chance unfortunately yes but you did get the chance to write the editorial on the book of on the collection yes. to write the year and it's been exceptional I think like and and this gestured towards as well you know like working in a collective and you spoke about it Renee like it is a new experience and it is something different <laughs> and it is definitely yeah like a but I think what I've loved and what is so, um, which, which brings us back to Heather and back to poetry is that specificity with words and the amount of time that me, Marion and Biz would talk about how, how we identified or how we wanted something to be identified. And we would have these intense conversations about words and it's just made me so careful. And so um, like, because we throw a word around words kind of so colloquially now without thinking about their actual meaning and this really drew us back and and I do not see it was um the title Heather had put on the entire collection so um so that was great so I took the I took the title from directly from yeah. Heather and mm -hmm. another really cool thing which um Janet Charman can uh, can definitely attest to is that um Heather often has multiple versions of a poem. And so the one I read at the beginning and sometimes in my single bed, there are three versions of that poem and they're just mm. like slightly off each other. And so as an editor, then I, you know, obviously you want to put all three in, <laughs> but um, people, readers don't love that. And so choosing between that is such a kind of an editorial decision, which I was so glad to have so many people's input because those kind of decisions are very difficult. And I spoke to Janet as well, who, um, you know, I, I, think, I suppose I was kind of looking for, for permission from people from the collective and they, and, and they gave it support and permission and just incredible Manaki Tanga, incredible, like I felt so held and supported and it's just been the most incredible experience. It's so and interesting I'm, because um, I'm, I don't keep anything. If I, yes. if I start a new draft, I rip the other one away and chuck it yes. in the bin. Yes. Um, and um, every time I start something new, there's always a myriad of news, you know, like new every every week or so I'll change it and, and, and then I'll get onto the right thing. So I'll rip all the others and stick them in the thing because I don't want anyone. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> so, it. Yeah. Um, it, it because, and it also because it's not the thing. 
Mm -hmm. yes. it's just, it was just me making my way to it. Mm -hmm. And um, and now that I've got it, and once I've got it, then I'm just hooked and I just want that. And I don't want to be reminded that I, but I mean, it happens every time. It just yes. happens every time. And, so, and that's kind of why you think um, then, you know, like that the three the three versions that I'm reading, I'm like, these must all be perfect, you know, like, and so just choosing that because you wouldn't leave two non-perfect ones hanging around. <laughs> and yeah, that's what it's that, like, that really intense choice between them all. And I, like, I must thank friends of mine as well, who, um, poets as well, who I got to read over things that um, collaborated the choices as well. Definitely other people that have had input into this. And so many people worldwide, I've taken Heather's work to conferences in America. I've taken it home. I've taken it to the UK. And so many people adore her work. And that's a large part of why we're doing this. And um, a reason why I want to do a new and selected is that her work's not accessible to people in the way that it should be. A lot of the books are out of print or mm -hmm. really hard to access. And so it's like, and that, and so making it more available to the world. I, when I finished up this conference paper, um, it was in Washington DC. And the next day we came in and there was a seminar of like, I think there was 15 of us. And 12 of the people came up to me saying they had Googled Heather the night before and had spent the evening reading her poems. And so that was beautiful. They had found some contemporary yeah. ones. But like, I mean, like some, like, um, like Orewa was saying, Heather like was most, um, connected to those poems in the 70s and they're the ones that maybe people don't have access yes, to. I don't. I don't. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and so it's like right. they're the ones I'm, I'm really looking for and to put in. Um, and I open that up to everybody who would like to contact me and send me things. That's absolutely mm -hmm. acceptable. I know, Ray, I have your book here and I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> and you know because I'm really nosy right so I got my friend to read through it she's older than me and she wrote in who she thought the people were on different pages <laughs> <laughs> I'll send that to you Ray and you can say whether it's true or not <laughs> uh, Ray, do you want to speak to this? <laughs> <laughs> just me being um, <laughs> I was thinking now as you were speaking I was thinking um I've got all my diaries that I started writing when I uh, from 1979 yes. they're in the garage in um plastic <gasps> containers that my son insisted on getting for me because they were just hanging about in boxes and I am um and I was going to burn them no because um because I want to Yes. Uh, not because they've got anything revealing or anything, hardly <laughs> any of my thoughts in them at all. They're really just a um, a series of appointments and stuff like that. And um, but he said, "Well, would would I think?" <laughs> he said very tactfully, "Would you think a bit more about that?" And it's so unlike him to be tactful that I thought, <laughs> "Oh well, maybe it, like he feels quite seriously about it." <laughs> and, um, and so I said I would, but I mean that was ages ago, and I yeah, it's it's interesting to me to know how uh, sort of anxious you were to find anything that was remotely connected with her, oh, her, definitely. her life as a as a, a person, you know, human being sort of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think for us, like it's so beautiful like, to hear you talking about lovers and um this like this real like importance about that sexual element to us all and again like money it's like an untalked yeah. about thing the fact that we all make money and that we all have sex and yet we don't talk about it and it's no, like no. And that's why heather is so great because it's like erotic and sensual and connected and talking about past lovers in that way of cherishing the love and also showing how yes. the love has changed into friendship or whatever you know like in acknowledging those difficulties yeah in love um which i think i find fascinating that's what makes me so terribly nosy yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's sort of, i don't know i think i i, I only write i only write about it in novels and i suppose yeah it's it it never <laughs> actually you should to me anyone <laughs> yeah. would be, be interested really oh we're all very <laughs> interested <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, hey, hey I'm, I'm so sorry to kind of cut this short, but no, 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 no. No. Emma, we're so um, pleased that you're so goddamn nosy. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and that and that you've edited this work and um i'm so glad too to hear the class consciousness thing and it actually yeah. that reminds me that you know here we are in the poverty corner but um everyone will be wondering how to get hold of i do not seed and um it's available online for a whole lot of from a whole lot of different places but one of them is kobo which set itself up to be um, an ideologically sound alternative to Amazon. And um, you can get it from there for only $3.99, which is, uh, mm -hmm. as you already have calculated, less than a cup of coffee. Um, so that's the neo-capitalism corner done. Um, I should move us forward towards the end because we're five minutes over and um, and... Um, so what the important thing is I want to thank everyone for coming today. It was, it's, um, it's been a really, um, huge event for us emotionally, um, to be focusing on Heather again. Um, thank you, Mary and, and Emma for, for making this a reality and for doing it your way, which is totally democratically collectivized, loving, um, and thank you for the speakers today um, who have all brought us these different angles. Thank God. And um, you were, I think, really, if we were Heather looking down on this, Heather would be pretty damn pleased, don't you think? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've reached this moment, which is where in our heads around about 20 minutes ago, we would be at this moment and there would be an invitation to everybody to say, everyone speak up and have a very brief Cody row. But in fact, we've passed it. Or well, what do you think, Marianne and Emma? I, just for a moment, I went a bit like Renee and thought, okay, well, I'd better make a decision here. But uh, do you, should we open the floor for five minutes um oh. i know uh, i know yeah. Julie, that you've got to drive up to Pagatariki and it will get dark yes i think i think it's i think it's probably time um, okay uh yeah. but i see the family here is the family one? oh yes let the yes 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 uh, I didn't leave it know. open and let people who have to go go yeah okay yeah. one of whom is tilly though Oh, well, you'll have to carry on without me. Um, but uh, no, that's okay. I'm, I'm flexible. And I, I, I think I see something on the faces of of the family who had written something about photography much earlier in the chat. Uh, is there something that anyone would like to say at this moment just before we close? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Yes. Um... I am Neil McPherson, Heather's younger brother, and I just want to say how overcome I am at the recognition that Heather's had from everyone today. I remember way back in the 70s, um, before we, we, in 1974, we shifted from Christchurch up to Wellington, and Heather had our cottage that we had in Dover Street, Christchurch. And I remember before that, um, having a discussion about Heather and who, hearing that she wanted to start uh, the whole journey. And we had a discussion about spirals. And I don't remember how it actually came up, but I, I remember talking to her about how spirals could go around in circles, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, Sometimes they could spiral upwards. Sometimes they could spiral downwards or even sideways. And that, I, I remember how taken she was with, and I was with this conversation. It was like we came out with something no one had ever thought about before. And so she obviously took that um, and, and ran with it. So I'm just so pleased and, and grateful that everyone's acknowledged and, and seen how she is. And to, to think that my sister can have this international recognition is, is just amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. 
thank you. Thank you. Any any last moment? We've got 30 seconds. There's so just Rick? one little message from Rick, uh, Heather's son. He says, we won't keep people, but thank you so much to everyone. This has been a wonderful and special afternoon. Nga mihi nui, Rick and Jenny. Mm -hmm. And with that, perhaps we go on to Emma's last poem that she's got planned to read, and then to Ren's kind yes. of... Yes. Thank you. Oh, well done. Oh, okay. Oh, just like... No. Of course, she says, the vagina might be also a rose wet cave between warm thighs, the lotus in the lily pond, a sun's egg throb inside cupped hands, a writhing nest inside whose rim the welcome swallow swoops and flies, fork tailed trailing delicate blue membranes of infinity, while echoes shake cathedral domes and rib cage caverns hum, and soprano arias swoop from a tiger lily throat and crimson peony tongues lick the shining fiddle hair ferns. Inside their loam of rippling skin, hungry fish mouths nibble in and over swelling lungs, sizzling tides unleash novitaes, singing bells and tight string spasms inside burst urgencies of kiss. And eely shapes uncoil and shift and below each surface glitter dance the stars of afterlives. Okay, we're at the finish line. Thank you, Emma. Um, please welcome Emma's partner, Ren uh, Naitahu, uh, for the Kahu, uh, uh, the Karakia. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. ああ、カルキアタタ。うぬへ、うぬへ、うぬへ、きてうるたぷぬい。けわて、けままてなかててなたわいろえきてあらたがた。こやらいろんごさかいらへあけけろが。てなとくりえ。たいき。たいき